Uh, I'm uh, uh, Maria Mamolo, so now today we change a little bit the, the chair of the sessions in order at least to make a little bit, uh, to, to giving a change always makes things a little bit more uh, dynamic. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, um, Dr. Sergei Sherbov. Um, he is uh, uh, working uh, in Vienna at, at the Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein Center for uh, Demography and Global Human Capital. And uh, um, he will uh, uh, introduce us, so he's a demographer. Um, his uh, uh, topic, uh, more recent research topic, is uh, on uh, population aging. And uh, he will introduce us with a new uh, perspective on uh, population aging. Um, and at this point, uh, I uh, give you the floor to present uh, this interesting uh, uh, topic. Uh, what I kindly ask you is to um, uh, be sharp with the time slot, because uh, I think this is important than to trigger more discussion between us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marie, for the introduction. Well, uh, thank you very much, Matteo. Thank you, Marie, for inviting me uh, to express some of the ideas that we had. Well, actually, I became demographer probably about uh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago. I, initially, I was in space programs, uh, aviation and space programs. But many demographers came from different sciences, like Nate, uh, Ansley Cole came from nuclear physics. So, Okay, so today I talk about aging. Um, a new look on aging. Uh, so the work is basically based on what we did together with my colleague uh, Warren Sanderson from uh, Stony Brook University for the last 15 years at the World Population Program. At that time it was called like that, at the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis. So my talk will be basically like introduction to the book uh, that Harvard University Press published very recently. It was just a couple of years ago, and it was called, the, the, my lecture is, is, is exactly, uh, has the same name, Perspective Longevity, a new vision of population aging. That's what we basically were working with Warren Sanderson for the last, for the past 15 years. So I will first talk about, uh, I will first talk about some definitions of aging, because I guess that many people sitting here are not much aware of uh, demographic definitions. Then I will uh, talk about some new ways to measure aging, uh, give some introduction to, uh, to the so-called characteristic approach, and give some examples and uh, how the world, how aging in this world looks very different if we introduce, from my point of view, much more realistic definition of who is old. So, it is on purpose. I put here 2017 UN population, world population prospects. It's just the, 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 the major message that according to the data from world population prospects, 2017 revision, the number of older persons, and it explicitly shown here, those aged 60 or over, that's in 2017 United Nations defined old people, 60 plus. And then of course they're saying it's triple the number of old people, doubled, and whatever. Now, before we start talking about, uh, about the aging, just a few headlines, you know, like newspapers, journals, very prominent journals like uh, Economist, they all write about the same. The global aging poses significant threat to global prosperity, aging population poses global challenges, and so on. So before we talk about aging, let's look at the definitions of aging. So general definition, population aging is a process by which older individuals become a proportionally larger share of the total population. It's very general. Or aging is a summary term of shifts in age structure towards older age groups. How do we measure population? The aging of population is often measured by increases in the percentage of elderly people of retirement ages. That's one of the definitions from encyclopedia of population. A median, the median age, the age at which exactly half population is below this age, half above, is another very popular measure of aging. And we are saying that population aging occurs when the median age of the country or region rises. These are definitions. 
Now, of course, old age dependency ratio uh, is also a very popular measure of aging, where we look at population, uh, the ratio of population at retirement ages uh, compared to the population in working ages. That was probably the most popular measure, and that's what, uh, for example, economists would always use. But who is old? That's a key issue. So how do we measure proposal for older people? We have first to define who is old. And the United Nations, until very recently, defined people age 60. But even if it's 65, we still have this boundary kept constant. So it could be 60 or 65. Now this is a, short, a small question to, to people sitting here. Definition of who is old. Age 65 is generally set as a threshold of old age since it is at this period of life that the rates of sickness and death begin to show a marked increase over those of the early years. When do you think this definition was made? Any ideas? Nineteen sixteen by an uh, American sociologist, Isaac Rubinov. So more than hundred years passed and we still consider people old at age sixty five. Sometimes we even consider them old at age 60. And this is one of my favorite tables. It's the record of oldest male summiter of Everest. You see, in, in the, the youngest was, the oldest was 39 years old, well, from Nepal in 1953. Today, I mean, it's nine, 2013, it's 80 year old Japanese guy. And he, as far as I remember, was planning to do it again at age of 85. Of course, equipment is different, but people are also very different. So it's not that only equipment. Okay, now let's look at some traditional measure of aging before we move to um, defining some new measures. So I, I use some UN data, uh, basically uh, in terms of forecasts, they more or less, for our terms, doesn't really matter. For our purpose, it doesn't matter which, which population revision we take. Now, median age, of course, in all regions, rising. That's clear from 2060 to 2000, uh, from 1960, 50 even, 2060, 2050, it just rises everywhere. Oh, even Africa here is coming up. Uh, proportion of age 65 is rising. So it's all following, you know, these alarming st statements. Everything is, you know, we see that, for example, if you take Europe, from 10%, in, in less than 10% in, in 1960, up to 30% uh, in uh, 2050. And this is just Europe as a whole. If you take individual country, it will be even much stronger. And old age dependency ratio, it triples. It's even sometimes five times higher. Now, now let's talk about new measures of aging. So first, let's look at the, at the, at the age itself and at prospective median age. So the, 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 the literature on population aging is exploding, but the notion of age is still the same. Who is old is still the same. It doesn't change. So the co concept used to analyze aging have remained static for, for the last, I don't know, 100 years probably, since uh, I think Ballot introduced uh, old age dependency ratio in um, something like nine and 1911, something like that. Now, this is a, to illustrate this concept. Suppose a man living in Western Europe is going to celebrate his 60th birthday. Is he old? Now, I guess we have a mixed group of people here. Some would say, oh, no, no, he's not old at all. Some would say, oh, he's very old. But I think in general, today, it's probably, the person is probably not considered uh, too old because 93% of men would survive until this age, at least in, in, in countries with high life expectancy. However, about 150 years ago, only 25% of men would survive until this age. And probably at that time, someone at age 60 was really considered to be pretty old. Now, why is a person who is considered middle-aged today was considered probably uh, pretty old, you know, 100, 150 years ago? Because traditional age measures, it measures only how many years we lived since we are born. And it's backward-looking measure. So it, all people, you know, having the same age, they live the same number of years. And this measure is not complete, 
because it ignores changes in life expectancy. That's why young and old are notions uh, where we have to take into account life expectancy. So in two papers, uh, one published in Nature, another in Science with, with Warren Saunders, with my colleague, we basically introduced uh, measures of aging, uh, of age, first of all. We called it prospective age. Prospective age is a forward-looking measure. Uh, and I, in a minute, it will be clear what, what it means. So basically, decisions that people make today, they're very much dependent upon how many years people expect still to live. Like uh, probably 100, 150 years ago, it would be very uncommon that someone buys a house at age 70. But today it happens a lot. 100 years ago, it would be very unlikely that someone goes to university at the age of 55. I knew lots of, I was teaching for many years in the Netherlands, in Groningen, and we had many students above age 50. So people know their future know how many years they will be still around, and they make decisions accordingly. So many, many aspects of our life, economic, social, they depend upon our general knowledge, how long we are going still to stay on this planet. So basically, prospective age, as we introduced uh, uh, this measure, prospective age measures how old people are not only from the date of their birth, but taking into account, basically adjusting this age with lengthening life expectancies. For example, coming back to our example, so using the concept of prospective age, you may say that someone who is 60 years old today ca can be compared to someone who was 43 years in, 19, in 1850. And vice versa, someone who was 60 years old in 100, 150 years ago probably could be compared roughly to someone who is 74 years today. And in a minute, it will be all clear how this is calculated. Basically, we recognize people of having two different ages. One age is chronological age, and all people, all groups of people who have the same chronological age, they lived the same number of years. Now, in contrast, we have prospective age. And it's concerned with the future. And everyone with the same prospective age has about the same remaining years of life. So a prospective age requires a year of reference, which is called standard year. And for example, all people who have a prospective age 40 have the same remaining life expectancy as a 40-year-old person in a standard year. This is slightly like inflation in economics. Basically, after we introduced this measure of prospective age, there was sort of explosion of papers, uh, and also we called it uh, as inflation of age. But inflation of age is probably a good thing, because uh, uh, we use, in economics, we use price indexes, you know, to, 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 to um, um, adjust for, for inflation, and we measure, for example, prices in standard dollars of 1960. Similar thing we do here. We measure age, but uh, uh, in, for example, standard years, again, could be 1960. But instead of price indexes, we use life tables to do this in demography. So this is an example which will clarify. I did it just especially for, for Italian data. So suppose this, what do we have on this uh, slide? We have prospective age, 40. Standard period, 1950. So what do we have here? In 1950, females at age 40 had the remaining life expectancy, 35.3 years. Men at age 40 had the remaining life expectancy, 33.7. So in all those periods, for example, 19, in 2019, women at age 51.3 had exactly the same remaining life expectancy. The same with men at age 50. So all those people have the same prospective age as we select as a standard, 1950. That is the basic. So if it's clear, we can move further. Now, that's how these ages look like. Now, what we have here. I selected as a reference year, 1940. Uh, sorry, uh, 2019. I didn't touch 2000 because 2000, you see here, it just, it's, it's COVID. So it slightly changed the things. But then, at least prospects, United Nations forecasts, and, and most of the cases, they basically ignore this small change in life expectancy. So let's look at this trajectory, 40. 
So in Italy, females in, nine, in 2019, at age 40, had particular life expectancy. It's not important what was this life expectancy at age 40. Now, at those ages, along this curve, they had exactly the same remaining life expectancy. So, in 1960, women at age 30 had exactly the same life expectancy as women in, 19, in 2019 at age 40. So this is basically scientific justification that 40 is a new 30. And you would see it all the same food for men, even, even sometimes stronger in seasons. Basically, for most of the ages, well, of course, when we move sort of higher, it's slightly different. But still, we have 60 is a new 50. 70 is, yeah, basically a new 60. OK? So which means people are different. And the same you have for men. Uh, that was the United Kingdom, also very, very similar. Uh, this is Japan. Japan even stronger. You see, you have here in age 40. Uh, in 2019, it is like 25 in 1960. So, 40 is a new 25, yes. Thank you. Uh, have you analyzed uh, the, any qualitative indicator? So, we can't say th uh, 40 is the new 30 unless we look at the health at that age because the fact that they are living longer may just be because when they get chronic diseases, they are living a low quality of life for longer rather than seeing the onset of illness later. And I think it's important to understand that we're good at keeping people alive longer now. That doesn't necessarily mean the quality of life is demonstrably different. And so thinking about what your grandmother was like at age 40 versus your mother at age 40, are there health-wise indicators at those equivalent ages? Yes, this is this important question, but this is, this, is, this is the topic of the whole presentation. Yes, I will mention about that. And this book that I referred at the beginning, it has two, I think, or three chapters devoted to that. And in simple response is that people are healthier. And you can see, for example, for men, if you look men, they just, their healthy life expectancy goes basically in parallel with their, oh, sorry, with their uh, life expectancy overall. If you take female, that's also a topic of special papers because subjective health of women usually is lower. S subjective health. But what is subjective health? We had uh, this 2008 uh, crisis, financial crisis, and then suddenly everyone share, share, share showed that everyone had bad, worse health because it's subjective. Many things are, so that's, but that's a very separate topic. If you look at some objective measures of health, basically people are healthier. Okay, so the same, you have the same for the United States, for France, basically this is general picture. And Austria. Now, now let's look at aging. If we introduce this concept of prospective age, so basically, we standardize age with increase in life expectancy. So that's what I put here. So using the concept of prospective median age, we may come to the different conclusion about the whole history of aging. Look here. Here we have traditional median age. What is it here? We have here Switzerland, you know, from 1876. So of course, median age comes up on average. No? But if we standardize it with increase of life expectancy, basically, we select a standard year. I think here I selected 1980. That's why they were over, overcrossed in this year. Now, let's look. This is a history of prospective median age. Population are becoming younger. Once we take into account increase in life expectancy, populations are becoming younger. And of course, they cross over here at the, at the year of standard. Of course, this curve. Important is to see the dynamics, not the level, because the level would depend which standard you are we select. The same as uh, with standard dollar. If we select 1960, it will be one level. If we select uh, 2010, it will be different level. So the same story here. But important is the dynamics. So population is becoming younger. Now, England and Wales, very similar story. So for the last 150 years, population now is younger 
than it was 150 years ago, if you take into account increases in life expectancy. So these are for some countries, for some selected countries, again, uh, like Italy. Of course, you have here some jumps. That was uh, Hispanic flu. Uh, this is a wartime, but the trend is that population uh, somewhere at the end of, uh, well, before 19, was younger than it is, uh, was older than it is now. The same you have Sweden, you have similar to Austria. For Russia, it's very different because life expectancy was decreasing in Russia for the last 40 years. It's only slightly increased recently. Now projections. So that's how you end, uh, okay, that's life expectancy. Uh, okay, here is median age. This is traditional median age, median age for all regions of the world. And this is median age, prospective median age, if you take into account that life expectancy is increasing. So basically, not much aging is observed in the next 100 years. Uh, and that's for, uh, for, for some countries, for India, whatever. Uh, for India, I think China, but uh, I will have more pictures on that. Now, we, had, uh, we used uh, 2017 uh, you know, probabilistic projections. And I show you the probably uh, together with, with people from UN. Uh, we, on this picture, you have probabilistic median age, traditional probabilistic median age. So what is probabilistic? Which means that the chance is 90% 90, uh, 90 that median age in 2000, 2100 will stay in this area. Okay? Now, this is prospective median age. Of course, it is much smaller. It comes down, but the probability range or prediction range is about the same, but much lower level. I think the same we have for, the, for Germany. So uh, median age is stabilizing somewhere uh, by the end of the century because the structure becomes almost stable and prospective median age comes down. Now, this here we talked about median age, analog of median age, prospective median age. Now let's talk about the second measure that we discussed with you, that's proportion of older people or a old age dependency ratio. Now, what we have on this picture, here we have proportion of people above age 65 for OECD countries, you know, from the beginning of last century. It is increasing, definitely. Now, this is just simple averaging. Now, how life expectancy was grown at age 65? That's life expectancy at age 65. It was also growing for all those countries, you know, from 19... Up to almost now, okay, I think it's up to something like 2010, but it doesn't matter. Now, this is average, so it was growing. Now, let's see, somewhere in the end, in the middle of uh, 70s, last century, 1970, 1975, life expectancy at age 65, both genders combined, was about 15 years. Now, let's assume that like in the 70s, someone with remaining life expectancy 15 years is old, okay? Now let's see what would be the age that would correspond to life expectancy 15 years and less. That's OECD countries. So you see, definitely it's around 65 in the 70s, but it's coming up. And today I think it will be something like 75 or close. So this is combined, averaged. So you see, it's already in the 2000s, it's already 70. Age when remaining life expectancy is 15 years and less. So let's assume that someone is old, as I mentioned already, when on average life expectancy is below age 15. Let's call this age old age threshold. Now, how would proportion of old look like with this new definition of older people? So this is proportion of people with remaining life expectancy 15 years and less. And it's averaged, no aging for the last 100 years. No aging, once we consider dynamic old age threshold, there is no aging. And this is very strange, at least to my point of view, and that's why we started all this work. When we compare people of age 65 over of age 60, 100 years ago and 100 years ahead, it's, these are completely different people. Their health different. Their mental capabilities are different. Everything is different. Physically, they are different. As I showed you at the beginning, this example of uh, Everest Summit. So people are very, very different. And we still consider them comparing someone who was 100 years ago with 100 years ahead. 
just assuming that people are the same. Now let's look at uh, projections with this new definition of age. So we look at, we say people are aged not at age 65, but when they have remaining life expectancy 15 years or less, dynamic old age threshold. Now, this is traditional 65 plus. Of course, it's strong aging. This is when we have proportion of people above old age threshold, which is remaining life expectancy. It's a very, very different picture. You see, for some countries, it's even become younger, people become younger, but it's a very, very different picture. Now, this is old age dependency ratio, basically the same. You see, triples, six times higher. And these are combined, kind of Europe or Africa, if you take, for example, Italy. Next picture, I think I'll have Italy. And this is prospective old age measures, which take into account increase in life expectancy, a dynamic old age threshold. It's a completely different picture. And this is uh, just for a few European countries. Look here, Italy. It starts with 0 0.4, 0 0.2 in uh, 60. Where is Italy? This one. Even less. And it would be just in, uh, in 2050, something like 0 0.8. So for, for 10 people, working eight people in, in retirement ages, if we consider them traditionally 65 retired person. And it's a completely different picture if you take into account that people are not old at age 65. They're older much later. They, we have to take into account life expectancy that people live longer. Okay, that's another, just let me check. another example um, that we did some time ago, actually I think even with Maria, uh, that was uh, when we made this European projections, European um, demographic data, um, data sheets. So this is a, a picture, uh, uh, this old age dependency, traditional old age dependency in 2030, and we see that uh, the, 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 the blue colors show low level. So low level is in the Eastern Europe and high level is in the Western Europe of traditional old age dependency. This is when we take into account life expectancy. It's a completely different picture, it's a reverse picture. Now people from uh, countries from Eastern Europe, they are becoming immediately old because life expectancy is much shorter. Okay, this just, I just did some uh, using nuts uh, to level uh, just some old age threshold for Italian regions. And you see this is for females, the highest old age threshold is uh, Trento, above age 75, so women should be considered middle age, probably until age 76. And men, uh, Balzano is something like 73. So if someone is below age 73, probably they're still almost young. And, but we, what was surprising to me, very pretty big difference. This is old age threshold. It's about uh, four, fourth year difference. It's regional difference. And that's old age dependency. Traditional old age dependency, also Italian regions. And if you take into account increases in life expectancy, that per person is old when his remaining life expectancy is 15 years and less. Completely different picture. Okay, this is uh, for probabilistic sense. This is even more interesting because you take people 65 plus, this is Germany, that's traditional proportion 65 plus, that's proportion with threshold, old age threshold, 15 years and less. It's not only that it's much lower, but also the variance, the, the spread is much lower. And that can be shown mathematically. In the book, I think we have a chapter in application, uh, in appendix where we show this mathematically. And this is China, and this is old age dependency ratio. Here it's completely squeezed uncertainty. So this is traditional old age dependency. This is perspective, which takes into account that, that people uh, takes into account life, increase in life expectancy. So not only it's just much slower, it's just also much certain. This is China. Okay, now let's look uh, few, at some features of dynamic old age threshold. Now, on this picture, I show, like for several European countries, proportion of adult life above age 65. What I call here by the adult life. Uh, that the person yours lived above age 65 in this case, divided by overall person yours lived in adult age above age 20. So people spend more and more time, males and females, above uh, in, in their uh, old age. If you look at traditional pictures. 
Now, that's how old age threshold is changing. You see, if it was around 65 in the 80s, now it's above 70 for, female, for males and above almost 75 for females. That's how proportion of adult life looks if we take into account this new old age threshold. It's a completely different picture. People spend less and less time in adult age, in old age. So they spend more and more time in the productive ages. This is another justification why we should look at the different old age threshold, not 65, not fixed. What we have here, five-year death rates at two old age threshold, one traditional, 65, and another, this dynamic. You see, traditional one, life uh, death rates is just declining, declining everywhere, Austria, Italy, Sweden, well, Russia is a special case. And if you look at the... Uh, Prospective old age threshold, dynamic old age threshold, it is basically constant for the last 100 years. Mortality at, age, at the old age threshold is almost unchanged. These are period data. Now, the same is for cohorts, which is even more important. These are cohorts. You see, of course, the cohort have to die out, then we can check what happened to cohort. You see, this is, tradi this is traditional 65, so mortality rates at age 65 would fall all the time, but at, at old age threshold, they're invariant. They're invariant for all countries. So that's what we should select as a threshold and not something which is changing you know, every, every year. Uh, now, we all know that life expectancy, the highest life expectancy, the, lower, uh, the, the more aging is happening. This is only when we look at this traditional, from my point of view, not, not justified a measure of aging of age. Now, if you take into account new measures of aging that take into account changes in life expectancy, that people are living longer, that they're healthier, that they're physically stronger, then the picture is very different. This is just an example. Projections for Germany. Increases in median, changes in median age from 2013 to 2015. If we have this first scenario is no change in life expectancy, this one is one year change in life expectancy, two years change in life expectancy per decade. Now, now what happening? If, if we don't have any changes in life expectancy, population in Germany, median age uh, population in Germany is three years older by 2050. With one year, it's four years. With two years per decade, the population becomes six years older, median age. With perspective measure, it's completely different. Of course, if there is no change in life expectancy, it's the same. But if you have two years per decade changes, increase in life expectancy, then population is becoming younger. Uh, now, we generalized it all, it also in this book. Uh, we introduced the whole concept, which is called characteristic approach to the measuring of population aging. So what it does, basically we look at characteristics of people and we see how these characteristics change at different ages. And, oops, what is this? What is the sound sensor? And using this approach, we may study aging uh, and the speed of aging along different dimensions because aging is multi-dimensional thing. Uh, we have to look at the different characteristics, physical, cognitive, health. And old age threshold can be different in different, if you use different characteristics. What is good with this approach? That we convert everything to the same metric, and this is age. And then we can combine different measures of aging, like walking speed and chair rise or hand grip. Completely different measures. We can combine them in one measure because every one, every measure refers and trans translates a uh, particular measure into age. And this is just, uh, I think, important example for United Kingdom, showing different characteristics, although taken from life table. Now, what do we have here? In 2010, at age 65, we fix life expectancy, we fix mortality rate, and we fix, we call it life course ratio. It's the ratio of people at, at 65. It will be 65 person years live above age 65 to a person years lived above age 20. What do we see here? Now, if we take mortality rates, so what, what is here? Here we say that in 2000, if we fix it in 2010, then according to UN, in 2040, mortality rate that was observed 
of people at age 65 in 2010 will be observed to people at age 70 in 2040. Now, the same remaining life expectancy as was at people at age 65 would be uh, in 2040 for people 67 or 68. And life course ratio, which is basically also in this book, we have the whole chapter about pensions. Some very, very rough estimates should be to have intergenerational equitable pension age, it should follow this trajectory. It's life course ratio, as we call it. So basically, if people are retiring at this trajectory, they're retiring at better health conditions. If we can say that mortality is a proxy for health conditions, and usually it is, and there were a number of papers, even including one Jim Votel, which shows that basically it's, it's, there is a strong correlation. Uh, this is also another example of use uh, of a different characteristic, which we call hand grip strength. It shows that people with high education are aging slow, more slow than people with low education. Here, for example, reference group is people with low education. United States, it's, it's health and retirement study. At age 60, they have the same hand grip strength as, people, as, as male at age 65.8 with high education and women at 65.7. And of, you see, uh, of course, it, it diminishes because of, of the selection. Further, there is, I think, selection is, is manifested very strongly. Uh, okay, this, thinks, this, this approach was or has already been used by United Nations. It was used in a World Aging Report, in World Aging 2019. Uh, actually, we are planning to do some joint paper with them uh, also now. Uh, and that is, I think, time is already running. Okay, but this is the last thing. You remember I showed you that people were called older persons called by 60 in 2017 revision. Now, in revision 2090, they're not calling them anymore older. They're just calling people aged 65 and over. And I think that's partly, you know, maybe some, some of our influence. We have data sheet. If someone is interested, we prepare data sheet on aging, just all countries of the world based on UN data, plenty of different indicators based on new old age threshold, on new definition of age are calculated. And uh, yeah, okay. And the major conclusion is that, of course, there will be sort of challenges due to aging, but we should not, there is no uh, reason to exaggerate them simply using mismeasurement. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergei, for your uh, interesting presentation. And uh, I think uh, there is uh, quite a lot of space for uh, uh, questions from the public. Oh, thank you for uh, this uh, interesting presentation. So, now, well, uh, I have a technical question. So, how do you compute uh, expected uh, life expectancy? I mean, uh, just on the statistics of the current population? Or, uh, or this is one question. The other question is, uh, um, yeah, so, so, um, somehow it's related to the earlier question. So. Uh, the how much has, uh, say, expenditure in a health system increased uh, in in this year, and 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 also how much more time have uh, we spent uh, in education age? I mean, how how long did uh, um, people uh, I mean uh, spend uh, in education? Probably it has increased. I mean. So the, the, the well-educated people, maybe uh, we didn't have PhD programs, for example, I don't know, 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so is there a measure of how much uh, the education uh, time has increased uh, on average? You, uh, OK. Uh, so first, first question is very simple because in demography there is a very, very standard way of calculating life expectancy. It's called period life expectancy based on this year uh, mortality rates. So we measure mortality rates for every age group and we calculate it's, it's just standard. It's called, these are called life tables. From these life tables we know 
uh, expected uh, life expectancy at every age. So this is very standard technique. There are cohort life tables, and I showed some example with cohort life tables. There we have to wait until all members of cohort, you know, die, and then we can calculate so-called cohort life expectancy. Unexpected uh, prospected age is just constant. I mean, if you define prospected age in, in this way, I mean, it's just the, the distribution which is moving. I mean, no. Uh, so your question is basically: Is it the question is uh, whether we calculate life uh, prospective age using period or cohort life table? Is that the question? Because this is very important demographic question. Usually, if you see it in a group of demographers, that would be a question. And the good thing is, and we also had several papers on that issue, that unless there are strong disturbances, then a period, if you calculate a prospective, um, if you have prospective median age, or you calculate uh, based on uh, period life tables or cohort life tables, the results are basically the same. So the measures, of prospective measures of age, they are basically very, very similar. And that's a good thing, because otherwise, how do you measure it? Either you, do you use period life tables or cohort life tables? Uh, uh, now, regarding education, if I understood it correctly, how do we know uh, education of people? Well, they do spend longer in school because simply, I mean, I guess if you take 100 years ago, First of all, it would be a very small selection of people who would go to with, with the education, with the higher education. And I guess it would be not like now you have some, to be a medical doctor, I guess you have to study maybe almost 20 years or 15 years. So they do spend. Uh, but, uh, well, that's slightly different question, I guess. It's just, you know, I, I think is Anna is here, Anne? She may know because she was dealing a lot with education. Thank you. I think we have another question there. Sorry, on the other side of the room. That was great. That was really interesting. Um, I'm just curious about, in this last section on characteristics and so forth, on the, of course, there is, a, there is also an effect of absolute time in terms of how much we know, right? Um, so one of them is just the attitude towards, do you look at things like what better correlates with attitudes to risk or optimism or attitudes to change? To what extent is um, prospective age a better predictor of some of the characteristics that we consider, at least in the last couple of days, critical to changing our attitudes to time on the planet, sorry. So if you're, if, you're, if you're impatient to make your career successful because you think you're gonna be old when you're 60, um, that might have unintended consequences on the planet. And so I'm just curious about this whole obvious effect of absolute time on absolute levels of knowledge and which are better predictors of attitudes towards, say, the environment. Is it, is prospective age the thing that's going to be more important, or chronological age? Uh, now, first of all, prospective age has nothing to do with our expectations. I mean, in terms of individual expectations. We have forecasts of life expectancy. How they're done, it's a different story. Many organizations, many institutions are making projections of life expectancy or population projections. Now, when you make population projections, you have to assume something about future development of life expectancy. And if you uh, look, if you ask demographers, I don't think that there is any unique uh, sort of um, idea of what would be life expectancy in say 30 or 40 years. But there was a great paper of Jim Wapel with, um, I, I forgot with someone, it was in, in, in science, it was probably maybe 20 years ago, that we always underestimate increases in life expectancy, always. So life expectancy would be projected by UN, and in a few years, I mean in 10, 15 years, it would be high. The highest life expectancy would be higher than it was expected. 
So in this sense, what we are using here, there is nothing to do with subjective feelings. Subjective feelings are extremely important. That's what, what I mentioned. Like if you take uh, subjective health, because you may make measures uh, of uh, health life expectancy. And it's extremely tricky because I absolutely understand that distinction. I'm not, it's just that it has an impact on attitudes towards the future. If I know this to be the case, hmm? right, this physiological fact, not subjective or psychological fact, um, if I knew that to be the, uh, the case at the age of 20, I might have decided I'm going to spend 10 years, I'm not going to go to university. Okay, I'm going to spend 10 years doing something completely different, which is collectively profitable, not personally profitable. So I'm, I'm interested in those kinds of shifts in characteristics attended upon the insight that you're giving us. I understand, yes. Well, I think uh, definitely uh, you have your peers. You, leave, you see that most of your peers are still alive. Okay, and if you would compare, for example, with the previous generation, probably people would live less. So you, knowing from, from the literature, from, from, from environment, from people around you, you know that people live longer. So you know that probably uh, you would live longer because that's, what you, that, that, that's where medicine comes, where all this research comes. So that's why probably most of the people would not consider that they pass away, you know, when they study, you know, at the university that they will be, uh, you know, dead at age 40, 45. They know, of course it happens with some delay. I guess in this sense, of course, you are right, because you don't know what's going on to be the future, you didn't experience it. But you know what has already happened. You know when our parents die, when some people close to us die, they die definitely, in most cases, at later age than our grandparents. So we see these dynamics, and of course, I think these dynamics uh, also is sort of projected for our own behavior and our minds, if this is a response. Hi. If, if uh, this prospective age was, had, had to be used uh, not only to study population dynamics, but um, to take decision on the individual, like retirement age, or whatever, right? Uh, then the individual person would probably might have different prospective age depending on which uh, um, region or you 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 calculate the estimate. So, for instance, if I um, I have a prospective age based on expected life in Italy or in Europe or maybe in my home region or maybe in the region where I'm resident now, because you saw that there are different you show that there are different um, life expectancy changes uh, across regions. So. Um, how to choose, uh, you know, the, 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 the spatial group, country, region, of Europe, to, 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 to use, to, to, to define the prospective age, if prospective age had to be used at the individual level? Uh, prospective age is always population measure, because life expectancy is population measure. So you can, uh, you can construct certain groups, and you can sort of, you know, having, that's what we also, uh, also did, like, uh, you could uh, sort of associate yourself with a particular population group, and then you may say, okay, that's my prospective age. But you see, most of what I was telling today and tried to say, it's not about even the future, it's about the past. That we always, we compare people today at age 65 with people at age 65 almost 100 years ago or 60 years ago. And that's already not correct, because people were different. You, <coughs> in Europe, we have, on average, about two years per decade increase in life expectancy. Okay, at least before COVID, COVID is, uh, it will have very little impact. It has impact on period life table, on a particular year of COVID. But if you uh, just do sort of a cohort things, it will have almost no impact. So what I was mostly telling, showing the history, you know, this history, the population is becoming younger if you take into account changes in life expectancy. So there is not much, um, how to put it, our subjective feelings. You can build, we are actually, uh, one of the chapters, we, 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 we do this type of things on subjective uh, health, on subjective issues, but 
most of it is objective. You had life expectancy, particular life expectancy. You know the proportion, you know the, the people, uh, the, the age structure of people, you know life expectancy. You can adjust things and you see that that population is, is not really aging. I think that is the major message. So we have to use correct measures and we have to take into account that people live longer because what's happening now, uh, governments increase pension age on one hand, like 60, 6, 67, 68, now, but they still say that we are old at age 65, which has no logic, because they say, okay, then they increase our pension age uh, in, in old age. Instead of saying, no, people are different now, people are not old anymore at 65, and that's what strikes me usually, because when I read, okay, 65, old age, okay, then people have to work until age 67, 68, so they force people like to work at old age. No, they should say, 65 is not anymore an old age. So that is the message. So um, if there are no other questions, I would uh, I thank uh, Sergei for his presentation and I invite Professor Brian. Thank you.